Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT racers to discuss their lives, their journeys and their ambitions as well as their relationship with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. The man, the myth, the legend is always beside me and here he is. Hiya Steve, you alright? How do you mate? I'm well, all good. Are you excited about this next guest? I don't know about excited. No, I spent a lot of time with this man uh, racing, away from racing, trials, bike riding, doing various things. There was, there's always plenty of banter. We're always at each other, but we're actually going on away on holiday together in a couple of weeks' time. That's romantic. Yeah, very. Let's get him on. Cuddly. <laughs> Okay, normally I'm introing this, but I'm handing this one off to Steve because um, not only is this man an absolute legend, but he, he holds a, a dear place in your heart because, as we were talking before the podcast started, he, um, he's helped you along a lot along the way, right? Oh, mate, don't big him up too much. <laughs> Sorry. Neck. He's, he's, he's struggled to get through that door already. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, pretty good actually. It's made played a major part, not just in my career, in other riders, but uh, been a big part of me, my career, and kind of advised in many different ways, really, and, and always kept it straight. In true Yorkshire style, uh, very honest. Don't you don't always hear the answers you want to hear, but uh, <laughs> no, I'd like to welcome Mick Grant, obviously, onto the podcast. Uh, Mick. You're a legend of the Isle of Man TT, seven, win, seven times winning, you know, um, come through some fabulous eras. You've seen many, many different things and uh, you've been around a long time, mate. It just seems a long time ago now. but yeah. <laughs> And things were different then. You know, everything, everything was completely different. Um, but, yeah, I enjoyed it and I wouldn't change a thing on it. I'd have liked to feel more finishers um, because in those days the bikes... They weren't reliable, and very often you had DNFs, <clears throat> a lot more than they do now. But um, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's but it's it, the Isle of Man for me is a strange place. I just love the place. I really do. I go there, still go there for the TT and for the Manx. Um, I load my van up, I put my trials bike in, I put my electric push bike in, and I put a road bike in. And twice a year I go there, and I just have a whale of a time. It's absolutely brilliant, and I watch a bit of racing as well. It's been a long time, you know, Chris asks this question normally to all of our guests on the podcast. I know it's been a long time since you raced around there, well, dirt roads, obviously. But um, when you're running through no man's land and you get through to that archway and you get that hand on the shoulder, what are the feelings? What, what's, what's the rush going through your body? Well, just prior to that, you've got a dry mouth. <laughs> and the worst bit, actually, is putting your crash helmet on. Um, because once that's on, <laughs> you're, you're in it. And um, but yeah. once you're going down Bray Hill, it's you just got to it's you've got to be sharp and you've got to concentrate. So the worries are out of the way. Uh, I never used to sleep particularly well. I don't, I don't sleep particularly well anyway. But certainly before a big event like the TT, I wouldn't sleep particularly well. Um, it was just glad to get on with it. You know, it's just a nice thing to get going. You know, back in your, when, or when you first started, it was a huge era. You know, racing was massive. There's a huge uh, depth of field, um, quite, a, quite a lot of different manufacturers. The TT was very important for development of bikes and so on. But some huge names. You know, uh, the era just before yours, huge names. Yeah, everyone thinks that their era was the best era to be in. And I'm sure you, your current riders are going to say the same thing. Um, when I started... I look back to the 60s and saw Halewood and Redmond and all these sort of guys, Agostini, and they had a whale of a time. They really did. But as time has come on, things have got safer and got better, really. But certainly, if I had the option of going to a different era from what I actually worked in, I'd have preferred the 60s. Um, it was just, just a hell of a place to be at the time. I remember Honda when they brought the Honda 6 out. Can you believe the technology that was involved in it? Um, the dis Honda decided that from having the four-cylinder four-stroke Honda to beat Yamaha they needed a 6. So within just a few months from drawing, there's no CAD drawings or anything like that. They the designed a bike, a six-cylinder, made it. They actually booked four or five seats of the aircraft and put the bike in various bits on the seats of the aircraft, took it to the first Grand Prix, 
actually built it up and won the Grand Prix with it. I mean, that, amazing. that is just amazing. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. So what an era. All those massive names, you know, and they're, they're spoken about, even by people like myself. I never, obviously, before my time, of course, but, um, you know, Mike, Mike Howard, how good was he? It was, it was the Rossi of, of his era. He just had the edge. Um, I mean, Phil Reed, who unfortunately died just a few weeks ago, um, Phil was very, very close, but I think overall, Mike just had the edge on him. Um, and a lot of people said at the time that Halewood was good because his father loves money. His father owned Kings of Oxford, which at the time was a massive multi um, franchised uh, motorcycle business throughout England. But with or without money, Mike would have still done it, I'm sure. Special riders, of course, but you know, back then everybody raced all the disciplines as well. It's quite funny because as time's gone on, things tend to get more specialised. For example, and this is before my time, in the 30s, um, you should have had a bike, you probably did a bit of scrambling on, you'd have done a bit of sprinting on, you might have done the odd road race on. And then as time moves on, you get to the sort of 80s and Freddie Spencer was the last guy to actually compete in the 250 and the 500 Grand Prix together. In the days of Honda, Redmond and that, they would ride 125, 250, 350, and sometimes 500. Um, now, they're just down, to, it's, it's a matter of diminishing returns. And now you Grand Prix guys, they just ride one bike and that's it. You know, and if they've changed manufacturers, that probably take quite a while to get going again. It's just a different ball game completely. Do you think they'd ever go back to that time where someone will race Moto2 and Moto GP, or do you, do you think because of the, the, the competitiveness of it all? It's not, it's more the cost of it, I think. Is it? Yeah, I mean, we used to do the transatlantic match races, mm -hmm. and your, Fre your, your Freddie Spencers and your Kenny Roberts would come over. But it's so expensive now that once you sign a contract for a manufacturer to do motor GP, they can't afford you to be hurting yourself. Oh, and another and, and they've also got a very strict um, programme of events for, for the bike, so it's, it's just totally impossible. Mm. Uh, and it's, 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 it's sad, really, but things aren't going to go back to where they were, I yeah. don't think. So take me back, all the way back to the start of, of, of your racing career. How, how did you get into to racing? Well, was it a family thing or not at all? My father was a miner. Um, he had a Note 250 Jack, which never ran. <laughs> that was the nearest I got with him. Um, the first road race I ever saw was at Oliver's Mount Scarborough, um, and I just got such a buzz from seeing it. And my ambition was one day. For, I was in short trousers, by the way, watching people like Jeff Duke ride round. My ambition was to actually just have a race and maybe have a race at Scarborough. And um, it just it went from there really. Um, when I left school, I went. I was doing a fine arts course, believe it or not, at art college. Nice. And my parents, who were obviously very much working class, wanted something better for me than working down a pit shaft shoveling coal. Mm. And I thought that was a bloody good option to, for me to get onto. <laughs> but were um, they <coughs> were they disappointed? <laughs> <laughs> Distraught. <laughs> <laughs> but. I didn't, I, I'm not an academic, and I got halfway through this teacher training course, and uh, it wasn't for me, and I just, it was the most stupid thing I've ever done in my life. I mm -hmm. went out working on building sites, I was driving forklift trucks in, in carpet factories and doing all sorts, of, coiling car springs, doing all sorts of things to get money. Um, to fund your racing. To fund my racing. And in the early, certainly the first three or four years, I never, in my wildest dreams, I think I'd actually make anything at it. But it's just suddenly I could see light at the end of the tunnel and that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and I was ever so lucky. And all of that time, were the parents really negative and despondent with your direction? My parents were a bit fed up and they were set pissed off. They were very fed up that, that <laughs> I, I left the <laughs> academic bit of it. Um, but my, my father was brilliant in the fact he, he neither helped me nor stopped me. Mm. Um, and I remember... I think, they were, I think they were quite proud of what I achieved because I remember at the Silverstone Grand Prix one year, we, the, I was having a 350 race with uh, Jano Sarin. And, well, Jano was leading the race and I was, I was sort of second and we were going out together. And the guy that went down with, with my father to watch the race was in the grandstand. 
And they said my dad got so excited he actually got two cigarettes going at the one time. <laughs> <laughs> so it must have been, must have been fairly pleased. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> so, the, so then it went on from there. So what was the light at the end of the tunnel when you noticed that you, you could potentially make something of this? Well, it, it wasn't, no, that wasn't the light at the end of the... The, the light... At, the thing for me, when I was at college, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. There was no light at the end of this tunnel. Suddenly, when I started... My first competition on a road going back was a baiting silk climb. I used to uh, wind, it out, wind it road out of a dam. Mm. And I just got such a buzz from it. And it's what I wanted to do. And the silly thing is that if I hadn't made a living at it, hadn't been good enough to do that, I still think rather than being a professional motorcyclist for 19 odd years, <clears throat> I'd have probably been a bus driver or a tram driver or something. Mm -hmm. But I'd have been still, even now, spending all my money going racing motorbikes. Yeah. At, at very much at a club level. But I was just lucky that it worked out for me. Lucky that you had the talent. Yeah. 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 And then it just went from strength to strength there. Yeah, it, it, at one stage, I was working with a, a right good friend of mine called Alan Capstick, and we worked for a firm fitting sprinkler valves in aircraft hangars in Lancashire. Two problems. I was the, I was the welder. Two problems. I'd never welded in my life before. <laughs> <laughs> and the second problem is I know how for heights. And these, these aircraft hangars... The 50, 60 foot tall. <laughs> I was having to go up there on a ladder with a hilter gun and welding torch. I have never been as frightened in my life. <laughs> you learned how to weld, though. Oh, um, I, 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 I was terrified. I hated going to work. <laughs> and we got to one stage, halfway through the, 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 the first year with them, I'm up this ladder trying to hit, hit this hilter gun into the into piece, piece of steel. And I suddenly realised that, hang on a minute. I'm earning so much from me racing and so much from uh, this job. I'm actually earning more money racing. And at that stage, I realised I got to go professional. Yeah. And it was almost like, from actually working my ass off, it was almost like um, a boat going down a slipway being set off for the first time. Yeah. I just, just slowly went into being a professional racer. So it wasn't necessarily something you were you were looking to do. You just realised that you were earning money out of it. Well, at I mean, time and... everybody at the lowest level of club racing, you know, the, the ambition is to yeah. do it for a living. So obviously that was the. But I've never really. I've always, even when I was racing, I was I always thought of myself as being the underdog, mm -hmm. and that's the psyche that worked for me. I mean, they get someone, like say Carl Fogarty. And Carl had got in his own head, in his own psyche, he was the best out there, which could be seen as big headed, but that's the way that his psyche worked for him. Mm -hmm. For me, I prefer, I used to win races and think, bloody hell, that was lucky. I won't, I won't, that won't happen again. It won't, it won't talent, yeah. No, and even though it did keep happening, I still didn't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> that's a, see, that's the difference between <coughs> Lancashire and Yorkshire. You get humble Yorkshiremen and egotistical people from Lancashire. No comment. <laughs> Huge career though, Mick. You know, obviously, um, back in back in that era, I keep saying back in that era, but but it was obviously there was a lot of money involved in racing. The gates were huge. You've only got to look at the things like the crowds at places like Cadwell Park. I'm talking in I'm talking in the UK to big nationals and things. So you'd be doing Grand Prix and you'd pop back to England do a big massive national race. You'd be doing the TT and so on. So it's a big massive long season. It was the best era for me because. I could earn sort of, I could go to Cabell Park, Browns Arch, Snetterton, Alton, and, and get paid quite good money. And I would have a 250 and a 350 Yamaha that were all paid for. Uh, I got good, I had good sponsors, but they were my own bikes. And then I would suddenly think, oh, why do this week, this next weekend we'll go to Hockenheim, we'll go to Aston or go to whatever. And you just, the, there was no red That's, tape, you just went. Yeah. And if you were in the fastest 40, you got a ride. Um, and you, you, I remember in the early, we, we go somewhere like Mallory Park and you Walter Villas and, and uh, Sarons and all these guys, I could walk rings around them. Mm -hmm. And then, and I, being a bit of a country bumpkin, that I still am, I went to Ockenheim, <clears throat> my first Grand Prix, and I finished, I think I finished 10th. And I was that embarrassed. I never... Plato won't believe me. And <laughs> I never went to pick my prize money up. I was that embarrassed. That you finished 10th in the Yeah, in my first world. Grand Prix. Yeah. What were but, you riding, Mick? 
uh, 350 Yamaha. Yeah, yeah. But the, what I hadn't understood was that Grand Prix racing then was a completely different ball game to what I'd been doing in short circuits in the UK. And now you just expected, it wasn't being big headed, it was actually what I'd seen, was I could beat these guys at Brands Ash, yeah. Ma Mallory Park, whatever. But of course, when you go into their ground, it's a whole different ball game. Without going too much into it, how much will could you walk away uh, after a weekend of racing at Mallory Park? If you like, look at it as, as today's money. What would what would it be? Oh, in today's money, I don't know. I mean, we let's put it this way. I think in the in the mid seventies, I worked out every three week three meetings I, I could buy a house if I if I wanted. I'm, I've I've seen <clears throat> I've seen some. Uh, some paperwork from payments made to the whole paddock. I mean, it's huge. They can, and it was all cash back in there. I, 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 so I remember <laughs> seeing a, 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 a telegram offering Jano Saarinen, this is in 1971, it must have been, or 72, offering him £12,000 to go to Mallory Park Race of the Year, which would be, I don't know what it would be now, but just you could, buy a, you could buy two houses for that then. That's what year was that, mate? About 71, 72, yeah. Yeah, well, the same year, my man bought two and a half acres for four grand, five grand. <laughs> yeah. The, Cottage, there's, there's, but yeah. There'll, be, there'll be riders listening to this now who, who, are, who are paying out 60, 70, 100 grand just to go and ride hmm. rather than being, you know, taking that as prize money. Yeah, well, it was huge. Obviously, cra here, crowds, crowds, gate money was massive. So then in terms of crowd, what, how many people are turning up to the likes of Mallory Park, Cadwell? Number wise, I don't know. Mick might be able to answer it, but you know, like Capwell Park, the start finish straight, all that banking, it yeah. was all left inside. You couldn't see a blade of grass. Mm -hmm. Incredible, ever rammed. But don't forget, it was only the chosen few that were actually getting top money. Yeah, yeah. Most people wrote for not much at all. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it wasn't just as good as it looked. Yeah. But but I mean, by comparison, by today's standards, we had a lot better chance of it. Mm hmm. And and we spoke to Clive Paget previously about um, you know racing in the seventies. Like you said, you could rock up to ho somewhere like Hockenheim, and if you were one of the fastest forty riders, you could you could race. It's not like it, again, it's not like it is now where you've got twenty riders who just race week in week out. It's, it's I mean it's a closed shop now. If, yeah. if 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 Tobacco Money was still the main sponsor, if you're not from a tobacco um, orientated country, you're not going to get a ride no matter how good you are. Mm -hmm. Well, in those days, the the fastest guys, you know, the cream came to the top and the fastest guys won. Yeah. And t to me, you know, that was a lot healthier situation. I bet you've got some stories from back then, though, haven't you? Travelling the world and <laughs> how many can you tell us on that? How many, how many can you tell us here? The, the best ones you can't. I, mean, I, I did a book about <laughs> eight or nine years ago and, and the, the best stories you can't put in. But... Uh, <laughs> That's 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 life. <laughs> so at the time of, of you racing in the seventies, had the TT stopped being a world championship by then, and it was a it was more of a choice of, of the one day event or the two week event. The last time it was a world championship was nineteen seventy five, mm -hmm. and I won the five hundred race that year. That's that was my only five hundred Grand Prix I ever won. Yeah, um, and I remember in seventy six a deputation deputation of. Uh, guys from the bank's government came and had a chat with me and they said, what we're going to do about this? We're in a terrible situation. I said, well, it's the best thing that ever happened because, you know, the Grand Prix competitors prior to 90, when, when it was still a Grand Prix, they've got to come and spend two weeks, a lot of money, uh, whereas the normal Grand Prix in Europe, you're there three, maybe four days and you, you, you've got your championship points and gone. Plus the fact that the Isle of Man is so difficult to learn that if you say a lead in the World Championship in a 125 or 250 class, you've never been there before. Mm -hmm. There's a fair chance you aren't even going to get points the first year you do it. So it was totally unfair. And suddenly, to me, once they took the World Championship status away from it, the Isle of Man had a much better chance of surviving. So so I guess there's a, there's probably a lot of new listeners listening who who don't even realise this, but but essentially in, in, day, in today's era, it was... Essentially, part of the MotoGP Championship, yep. weren't it? You, you had to go there. Yeah. It wasn't a choice. You, if you wanted to be competitive in that championship, that's, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Is that is that why you went to begin with, Mick? Because you had to go, or was it was it on your radar anyway? Alaman TT. Look, if you if you enjoy riding a motorbike, you've got to ride the Alaman. There's yeah. no question about it. Um, at least just wants to try it. 
And I, I remember the first time I ever went over there, I, I, we'd no, I had no money. We, we, I was just working and spending every penny I got on racing. Mm -hmm. Still says the same now. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> and um, I remember I borrowed a Vincent Thousand to go over and look at the course on before the my first race there was the Manx Grand Prix 1969 and I borrowed a bike this Velis, this Vincent and took my missus on the back of it and we went to do a few laps uh, there are a couple of problems this, this Vincent which now will be quite a lot worth a lot of money it was worth sod all then it had a rattling big end so I was limited <laughs> on the number of laps I could do if it was going to get me back to Wakefield again so and as I said, I had no money. So the first night, we couldn't bed and breakfast, I had no money. So we, we slept in sleeping bags in a ditch <laughs> going up towards um, Glen Vine. And my missus complained about it, which I thought I'm not surprised. Well, wasn't fair. So the, the second night, I, I pushed the boat out the second night and we slept on the beach at Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you just can't satisfy some people. <laughs> she... She, I said, that, was that a lot more comfortable? Of course, we're in the pebbles, and it was, it was just like being on a quilt. A fabulous mattress, it was lovely. <laughs> and she said, I'd never slept because I'd just dreamt of the tide coming in and sweeping us away. So, but you can only try, can't you? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Blimey, now. You, again, you won't get that now, nowadays, would you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> so, so learning the course... You, it was literally just you and your missus going round and, and lapping on, on that? Yeah, I did a few laps. <clears throat> and then just a few weeks after that was the Max Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. I'd ride in my old Vela set. And again, nothing nothing went particularly as it should have done. I did all practice. And looking at the times, I thought, right, I'm in with a chance of winning the Newcomers Award here. And uh, we did the last practice on Friday afternoon. It was, it was wet. I put new tyres on, new chains on, all this sort of thing. Having a right steady run round. And at that time, the white lines in the middle of the road were quite slippery. They aren't now. They, they put sand or whatever in them. Mm -hmm. And I actually lost it. And I wasn't going quick at Greba Castle. Oh, and it was one of those crashes. I didn't break anything on me, but God, I just ached everywhere. And the bike was a right mess. So instead of having a week off before the senior Max Grand Prix the following seven days afterwards, I'm all bandaged up and I went to repair this Vela set. Oh. And... Uh, the race didn't go particularly well. Uh, I set off. I got my own. I've always been a bit of an engineer, but very much amateurish. And I'd made my own ignition system for it because I would save a bit of horsepower, I thought. And um, it was all going good. And then after the second lap, it, the bike started slowing down a bit. And eventually, the third lap, going down Hillbury, um, it cut out completely. So I got to push it back to the pits and sorted the problem out and set off again. With the net result, I finished 48th out of 48 finishes. So, <laughs> Are you finished? <laughs> so from You're there, finished. it could only get better. Eh? Yeah, and it did get better. How many wins did we say? Seven? Eight? I just S want to go back S to seven. that. Seven. <clears throat> so in, in true racer style, it wasn't your fault you crashed. It was the white line. The white line, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's registered. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So your first ever win there, how did that feel? My first win was in 1974 on mm -hmm. the... The, the Triumph, the Triumph twin in the production race, Slippery Sam. Um, Wait, it, Slippery Sam? It was that, called Slippery Sam. That was the nickname of the bike? The, yeah. the nickname, a very famous Triumph. Um, and it was that. nicknamed Slippery Sam because at the time it did some 24-hour racing and one particular race in Spain at the Baldor, um, it was leaking oil all through the 24 hours. And Percy Tate, who was one of the works riders, christened it Slippery Sam, so it was, it was always called, it's, in fact, even today it's called Slippery Sam, yeah. But it wasn't leaking oil when you were riding it around the TT course? No, we had, in practice week, we had, everything went wrong with it, cranks and all sorts How of things. How many laps then, Mick, race? I think it was either three or four. Steve won't even know this. The start, it was a mass start. You lined the bikes up on the Glen Clutcher Road, you had a Le Mans type start, and you've got to go and kick, there's no electric start, you've got to kick these things up. I've never been this frightened in my life. You're going down Braille with 20 other folk around you. I, didn't, I never realised that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So the bikes are at the opposite side of the road, you're yeah. on one side, you've run over, kick yeah. them up and then... Go. Yeah. I never knew that. I thought at the most it was like two riders, and no, I no, thought well, that was pretty dangerous No, that was just that was just for the production <clears throat> TT. Um, not, not a good situation. God. But I, I knew at the time that my main opposition... Because 
70, the year before, I was going quick enough to win, but I had DNFs, you know, crankshaft breaking or whatever. So I knew I was on the pace, and the only guy in 74 that I knew I would have bothered with but would be Peter Williams on the Works Norton. And because the triumph would a bit quicker, I knew if I could get going up the mountain mile in front of Peter, then the job was should have been done, um, which I did, but I think the Norton broke down anyway. So you, 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 you ride in in a completely different manner in, in that respect. You, 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 the person on the road in front of you is half a second in front of you or whatever. Yeah. It's not, there's no 10 second gap. So That's right. That must have been terrifying. There's the company got less, it was better. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I bet there was a lot of riders in that as well. There, there weren't, I think about 48, 50, not that that many. But thank goodness. Blimey well, I mean, now, that sounds... The good thing is there's only doing 50 mile an hour then. <laughs> Top speed. Quite, Top yeah. speed. Top speed. <laughs> <coughs> Top speed of 50 so, and um, what were you just uh, mentioned can, then? Can I just. Is, oh, God, here we Steve's go. taking the mickey out of me, <laughs> which I don't mind, I'm fairly used to it. But when when Steve was in, in the Honda team that I was running, I remember one particular time we we're at Brown's Hatch, and he's saying to me, Mick, this bike is so slow. It's so slow. And I'm really. It's got me feeling guilty, you know, that we haven't produced the horsepower that we, sh we should be getting. And I'm saying, well, how slow is it? Well, he says it's. Down the back straight at Brands, which is a long straight, I'm losing about half a bike length. Is that down Ding? Yeah, Dingle, Dingle Dell thing. Dingle yeah. Dell, yeah, yeah. That's half Dingle a bike Dingle length. Dingle. I said, it's that slow, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about whinge. <laughs> Steve, you got, uh, you got a retort for that? No comment. <clears throat> no comment. No comment. And there's more where that came from, so just be careful, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should. I think we should get into all that in uh, in in part two. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Right, yeah, let's yeah, let's get some truth out. Let's wrap part one up here, and we'll join uh, Mick again shortly for part two. I say shortly next week. Mm -hmm.